Uh, so, hey everyone, this is Finance Meets Real Estate. Uh, as you guys know, we meet here every Tuesday, uh, 6.30 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, we have, you know, amazing lecturers like our le lecturer here tonight. Uh, we cover, you know, the real estate industry and we have like some like financial <laughs> focus at times. Um, excuse me. And so, um, right. So tonight uh, we have Brian uh, Pellegrini here. So he's the founder of Intertemporal Economics. It's an advisory firm for uh, hedge funds, family offices, like various, you know, entities in interested in the economy, I presume, and in macro perspectives of the economy. So he's going to talk about how federal policy has effectively broken the yield curve into asset purchase and monetary policy sections. And so he used to work, so before founding uh, his current firm, he used to work as a senior analyst, analyst at Connolly Insight, a boutique global macro consulting firm. And he provides a rigorous alternative to the orthodox economic worldview by applying an in-depth investigative approach to analyzing economies and markets. That sounds awesome. And so prior, prior to Connolly Insight, Brian gained experience in positions across Wall Street, uh, including working with high growth technology firms, raising capital, structuring options, trades, valuing asset-backed securities. He was at Morgan Stanley as well. He holds an MBA from Columbia University, master's in finance from Northeastern and bachelor's in computer science uh, from Columbia as well. And he's also a chartered financial analyst. Okay, so that's a lot of stuff. That's really nice. I'm really happy to have you here, Brian, tonight. Thanks, thanks for having me. Uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure. And so, okay, so um, I've permitted like sharing screen whenever you need to. So if you wanna like do slides and so forth. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to put them on the chat or you know, or we, you, I can relate at the end, or if you want to speak up, that, that's okay. It's, you know, it's at some point moderately, but we, we're going to have a QA and a at the end primarily. So you can put your questions on the chat. And with that, I'm going to pass it on to Brian. Thanks, Stefan. Thanks. Um, so I'm going to share the screen just real quick. I'll do most of the talking on the um, mm -hmm. uh, thing, but then this way you guys can see, you can see that. All right. And you're looking at about the firm, yeah? Yes. All right. Um, so as Stefan just said, um, what I do is uh, advise my clients on uh, risks that are likely to come up in the next three to 18 months that um, I don't think are being properly understood or even noticed sometimes uh, in the market. And so those are the things I tend to focus on. I don't think that um, providing a regular point forecasts does a whole lot. There's, you know, a lot of people that could do that. Most um, firms can do that themselves. Uh, so um, having an understanding of what are the um, economic, social, and political factors that are going to be driving economic outcomes, that's what's uh, really important for being able to do your job, whatever that may be. Um, you know, my clients are experts in all the different things that they do. So it's, I figured out pretty quick that trying to, to um, teach them to do their own jobs wasn't, wasn't necessary. Um, but finding, figuring out the, the, the uh, how the machine works uh, that's driving outcomes in the economy and explaining that to people so that they can then make decisions and be ready for uh, risks that others are completely unprepared for, uh, that's what I do. So, um, you know, uh, on the uh, left or right here on the screen, if you want to uh, hear me spout off from time to time and see some articles that I repost, uh, you know, you can check me out on uh, Twitter or LinkedIn. Uh, the newsletter is for uh, a broad audience, retail investors and people just um, dipping their toes into Austrian economics who want to understand a little better how the economy works. Um, and then for institutions and high net worth individuals who want to uh, advisory services on uh, whatever it is they do. I advise banks, um, family offices, real estate investors. Um, if there's a, a, a factors out there in the, uh, in the real world that are going to be affecting how you do your job and you don't fully feel comfortable with them, um, that's what I do. So um, if you go to the Trader's Brief right now or to the company um, LinkedIn page, you can find this presentation um, so that uh, we can spend most of the time off the share screen there. And now I'm back. Yeah. All right. So 
breaking the yield curve. What's what's broken about it? What does it mean? And uh, um, how should we be thinking about it? So um, the current situation is a lot like the uh, transition from the 1950s into the 1960s and 70s, where um, the monetary policy environment changed and it inhibited the Fed's ability to smooth out the business cycle and have a nice uh, smooth growth pro profile, right? So um, the uh, it, when investors are, everybody seems to be getting ready for higher inflation, but uh, I don't think that higher inflation is necessarily what is going to help you. What you need to be ready for is inflation volatility. Right. So just like in the, the 1930s and 1940s, and then again in the 1960s and 1970s, um, international capital flows and political uh, considerations are going to prevent the Fed from being able to do its job. And since it has to juggle multiple balls at the same time, its performance on what it targets is going to decline. Um, and the way we're seeing this manifest is, uh, and the reason that it's going to become a problem, is because the information that gets transmitted across the yield curve is being inhibited by monetary policy. So as Stefan mentioned, the front end of the yield curve, right, the first uh, from, from the overnight rate out to say three years is dominated by forward guidance. So what is the short-term interest rate going to be tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day? And that determines how, it's, how the yield curve is shaped in the front part. Normally, that would then transition into a long-term understanding of how, what the potential growth rate of the U.S. economy is, um, and that would shape the back half of the yield curve where the bond market operates. But the Fed's asset purchases and the changes in how it operates monetary policy have created a second portion of the yield curve that's dependent on its balance sheet policy not information transmission from the front end half of the yield curve. And so that's why um, right now there's been so much volatility in the middle of the yield curve. That two year to five year portion of the yield curve is all over the place. Uh, whereas the other, the front end and the back end are much moving much less because uh, those two sections of the yield curve have um, a pretty clear drive. On front end, it's forward to guidance and on the back end, it's asset purchases. In the middle, it's not clear. Is there information being transmitted or is it being dominated by uh, uh, administrative policy? So but this is what we're going to look at more in depth tonight. Um, and so and I, on the upshot, uh, eventually, I think the, the Fed will be forced into implementing yield curve control. Uh, they already have the tools in place for it. I think they're preparing for it and uh, for the sake of Controver internal controversy at the Fed. They don't want to discuss it until it's necessary. Um, so if you look at on page four on that presentation, again, if you go to the um, company LinkedIn page for everybody to join late, you can um, see the presentation. Um, the front, uh, it's also on the uh, substack, intertemporal.substack.com. Do you wanna, do you wanna share, Brian? If you would like to share, Stu? I mean, it's, you know, one of those things where it's like, uh, you know, okay. If they can stick them looking at my face, they can look at the thing. But uh, um, okay, up to you, up to you. Well, yeah, I'll go back and forth. But here, um, so what is broken about the yield curve, right? What do we even say? What does that even mean? Um, so the front half uh, is very, very steep, as I was saying, because people are expecting this tightening campaign, this very aggressive tightening campaign uh, that they're talking about, and then kind of pulling back, and then talking about. But but the market is pretty sure about what that's gonna be. Um, the back half though is flat and, and flirting with inversion periodically. And this is what is really important because this is a highly contractionary um, force on the economy, right? Banks, and we're gonna talk about this in a, a little later, that, that banks make money by borrowing short-term and lending long-term. So the, if, that flat, if that yield curve is flat, it, it has effectively shut off the lending markets. And it for the long term investments. Um, and that's going to slow down economic activity. So uh, the Fed is going to have to deal with this factor that um, the, the front half and the yield of the yield curve and the back half of the yield curve are not effectively talking to each other. So 
while this is going on, so we can see this is kind of a, a bit of a messy um, conglomeration of everything I've just been talking about, right? We got the, the front end and the back end, right? If you look at from uh, March of last year to April of this year, that big taper tantrum that took place in the middle of the curve and the front and the back end didn't move. After, right, once people started to, between April and now, um, everybody got really worried about out of control inflation and the entire yield curve shifted up as this expectation of moving into tight monetary policy took over, right? But what's been happening that whole time and what's going to be the undoing of the Fed's policy, right? What's going to make life difficult for them is this pivoting. And this pivoting is taking place, uh, and this is where we get into the Austrian theory of the long-term uh, potential growth rate of the economy, that the um, capital that's in place in the economy can only sustain a certain hurdle rate of investment, right? And if the, if the yield rate starts to rise too far above that, you start to get stock market unwinding and, and um, all the things that we see going on right at this very moment. Um, and so what is that, what that's telling us is that the Fed's projections for three and a half, four percent um, overnight rates is a guaranteed yield curve inversion, right? So they're not going to get to that. Um, they will back off long before that. Uh, so Brian, sorry if I may just interject just for a second, like sure. this is a quick question and I don't mean to interrupt like your no phone, way. but just in terms of, um, so the inversion that we saw a little bit earlier in the year, that was it was a very small inversion also, mm -hmm. right? In a way. So how much of that was due to the kind of monetary policy disturbing the genuine information transmission in the yield curve? Or, and how much was genuine? And is it like a real recession predictor mm -hmm. or is it kind of an optical one? Um, well, we're about to get into that. And it's, it's, okay. it's an interesting sure. question. It's, sure. it's, it's optical, but it will become real. Um, yeah. uh -huh. Okay. So, and that's the, that's the dilemma that the Fed faces is that they're, they're forcing themselves into this position, right? Mm -hmm. So the steepening, right? That's very, on the front end of the curve, that was very stimulative to uh, short-term debt, right? Consumer debt that tends to be less than five years, right? So, and we saw this, people have, pulled out their credit cards and have been spending on credit cards. Um, the, 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 the lenders are willing to lend to people for short-term maturities because they can make a, a pretty good return. That's now turning around and we'll see if that's a prelude to recession as the three-month yield is rising, right? And the five-year five yield is not. And that's what's causing this, um, the, the, the front end of the year, yield curve to flatten again. So that could be a prelude to recession. Um, the back end, right? That's this is where the issue of is it a, a signal or is it a cause? And what we're going to get into and show is that it's it's the the flattening of the yield curve causes the recession. It's not some sort of um, uh, it's it's not a thermometer that's telling you whether it's hot or cold. It's a um, a measure a direct measure of how profitable it is to to borrow money short term and lend it long term which is what banks do right and um when it's not profitable because it's more expensive to borrow short term than it is to borrow long to lend long term uh banks stop lending and that stops investment activity which slows down overall activity which creates recessions so in austrian theory a big part of the focus is on investment, right? So we've been so trained to think about um, the consumption, right, by the Keynesians. And the issue is, is that people are very, very slow to change their consumption. They don't want to change their consumption. They will mortgage their house to keep eating as many candy bars and have their cable and, and their sneakers, right? Um, businesses don't think that way. Businesses say, is this worth it or not? And if it's not, they don't do the project. So investment turns much faster than consumption. And that is what drives the business cycle, not the, the, the large, but slower and more predictable moves in consumption. Um, and so this is, the, this is what I'm saying is that the past times where the yield curve has signaled recession and a recession has actually happened, the front end of the yield curve and the back end of the yield curve have been in agreement, right? 
And we see that in the mid 1990s, uh, the mid, um, excuse me, 1980s, and again in the mid 1990s, there was there were periods where the the um, uh, the front end of the yield curve inverted, but the back end remained, and the economy did not go into recession, right? And the reason for that is is that lending to invest investors, right, to to people building buildings and doing things, um, continued, and the economy continued. So even though a short-term inversion was, was uh, perhaps um, discouraging consumption lending, consumers are very sticky to their habits and so they will keep going. So until that front end comes down, I'm not so sure there's a recession coming. I think that people are getting ready. It's an awful fast slowdown um, and we're gonna see what happens. And if the Fed keeps raising interest rates and they tie themselves to the mask, then yeah, we'll get a recession because they'll invert the yield curve. But I don't know that that's going to happen. They're, they might check it out. And if they do, and they implement yield curve control to fix the shape of the curve, um, then you could end up having a fast turnaround and, and right back to inflation. So this is uh, you know, where the question, how does monetary policy actually work, right? And this is where um, some of the, the fun part comes in, right? So uh, um, where does money come from, right? And you'll get the, the standard answer of, the Fed creates money. No, it doesn't, right? The Fed can accommodate money creation, right? But the initial money creation is when a bank says to you, here's a loan, right? We're going to put that on the asset side of our balance sheet. And for me to give you this loan, you need to have a, a bank account with us. And the reason that you need to have a bank account when you take a big loan is because they don't actually have that money. They just write it down in their ledger, right? And everybody says, oh, well, how could that, you know, how could it be that um, you, all the banks are creating money at the same time? Doesn't the uh, limit on reserves, um, doesn't the Fed limit that, right? And they can, but only by changing the shape of the yield curve and um, inhibiting the impetus to lend, right? Um, once you have taken that money out of the bank and paid it to someone, right? and made that transfer. It changes from deposits, which are liabilities of the bank that you use, and it changes it into money when that other person accepts it as money, right? And at that point, the Fed could say, no, we don't want this to become money, right? We're gonna fix the money, we're gonna hold the money supply fixed. And if they did that, interest rates would go up and lending would reduce, right? And the money supply would stay fixed. But because of the way they operate, right? And they have operated, they say the, the overnight rate is, let's say 1%, right? So that means that if I create money and then if I create bank deposits and then send it to Stefan and Stefan then his bank removes it uh, from the Federal Reserve um, account of the other bank. At that point, my bank would need to go and raise cash. The Fed prevents that from happening by providing the cash to the market and holding that interest rate fixed. And, and we'll talk a little bit about that, but they're, they're doing this um, more indirectly than you might realize. And so it's that money creation process that occurs when banks lend that accelerates or reduces economic activity. So when the yield curve flattens, banks turn off the money creation machine and the economy slows down after. And this is what's going to happen. And the Fed can very, very quickly reverse what's going on by implementing yield curve control and having and getting rid of that yield curve inversion. So what is the yield curve, right? Where everybody talks about it, but what the heck is it? Well, it's, you know, the obvious answer is it's a, a graph with the, uh, the yields available at various maturities. But what are those, right? Each of those is a market. Each of those points on that yield curve is a market for lendable funds or investable funds, depending on which uh, version of Austrian theory you read. Um, and so... At each of these places, there's a money creation process taking place with the banks. Um, and the shape of the yield curve is gonna determine how much money is available to do different things of different maturities. So if the yield curve at the front is, is very steep, there's going to be just more money creation for buying things, right? And this is what the Fed is dealing with in that they're saying, well, we need consumer infl inflation to slow down. Well as long as a bank can borrow overnight and lend to me for less than five years, they're gonna make a bunch of money. 
So they'll keep doing it and I'll keep buying stuff even though prices are going up. I need eggs, I need these things, so I'll buy it. Um, and that continues that inflationary process that is forcing the Fed to, to uh, tighten monetary policy. But on the back end, that money creation process is shut off because the yield curve is inverted. And so there's going to be companies laying off and, and, and projects getting canceled. And, and they're facing this dilemma of the consumer economy is still red hot, the producer economy is slowing down really fast. And the reason for it is the shape of the yield curve. So, um, Stefan, how am I doing here? Uh, uh, still making sense? Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. So it's, you know, it, it was an important clarification. It's not just, it's a, the, the real market at every point of the yield curve. It's not just a signal, it's a true, there's true economic consequences to the yield curve, to, you know, to the to curve flattening, basically, right? Exactly, That's like part exactly. of it. So, mm -hmm. okay. Excellent, all right, good stuff. Um, So the reason that the money creation gets forgotten is that we still tell this old tale about how the, the, uh, the Fed sets interest rates. And it's actually no longer true since 2008. And even in 2008, it hadn't been true since the 1990s. So if you look in an introductory textbook um, or even a, um, uh, an intermediate level textbook on how the Fed sets monetary policy, a lot of times there'll be the talk that, so they, in normal times, right, prior to the financial crisis, there was very few reserves available. So reserves are contractually required and, and used to be legally required bank accounts that the banks themselves have with the Fed, right? So all the banks, to be a bank, you have to have an account at the Federal Reserve. And the Federal Reserve makes the reserves, the, the, the bank deposits, just like your bank can give you bank deposits in your bank account, the, the Federal Reserve can do the same exact thing with its customers, the commercial banks. So the banks need to have a certain amount of deposits in their account each at the end of each day to maintain contractual and used to have the legal requirements. So at the end of the day, they have to settle up and say, okay, I need some cash and you have extra cash. We'll, we'll do an overnight borrowing transaction. And the Fed sets monetary policy by fixing, the, by manipulating the market in their open market operations, right? And this is how the story goes, to um, keep the price of overnight money at whatever rate they want it to set, right? And the, in the fable, in the, in the, in the, the, the story, they will buy or sell securities to um, add or remove reserves from the market to change the, the interest rate. But when you look back, right, the uh, banks have, by the 1990s had become so adept at managing reserves that um, there were no extra reserves around, right? And what was actually happening was the um, because the, uh, the reserves are decided on as a two week average and it's the prior two weeks, right? So it's not like they're uh, right now at this moment saying how much money do we have in the bank, right? So there's a lag to everything. And as a result, what that did was that allowed them to get down to the dollar, how much money they needed to have at the Federal Reserve. And because of that, because there was literally zero excess reserves plus or minus, you could have an announcement effect. So the Fed says, we're gonna tighten rates to by 25 basis points. The banks would instantly figure out how many reserves they needed to have to optimize their, their return on equity. Given that level of uh, uh, money market rate and the, sub, the, the demand curve for reserves would shift. So the Fed would very seldom actually buy or sell securities, right? The banks themselves would change the, the uh, supply and demand for reserves in the bank interbank market, right? So the Fed actually didn't really do a whole lot. More often they were preventing people from front running. Um, and so that's how things used to be, right? There were very few reserves around and so it was easy to even if, if, if the market didn't react the way the Fed wanted it to, $5 billion, $10 billion worth of, of 
uh, treasury bill purchases would could change the market entirely. So they had very little to do. It was it was fairly easy for their to do their jobs. That changes after 2008. They buy a huge amount of securities to prop up the, the, the federal government bond market and the mortgage backed security market. What that did was it because the Fed has to buy its securities from banks, it adds those reserves to the banks. And all of a sudden the banks had huge amounts of reserves at their bank account at the Fed, right? And the fear becomes, well, what happens if they suddenly lend those out, right? Um, so what the Fed does is it changes its, its operating system to an abundant reserves regime, right? And so in this case, they can't change the supply and demand of reserves because well, they could, but uh, if they would have to change it by so much that billions and billions of dollars, trillions of dollars to change the interest rate. So what they do instead is they set a reserve rate. So they say, okay, we're going to pay banks an interest rate on their reserves, IOR, the interest on reserves, um, so that they won't accept anything less than that in the federal funds market, right? So we're gonna set a minimum for the price of money. And this, you know, it worked, it, um, but it has implications, right? Because it, it works. And, and actually the Fed was on their way to setting this up. They had wanted to do this because of this issue of so few reserves being in the system. They had actually wanted to set this up prior to the financial crisis and it, it was accelerated by the crisis. But the point of, that I'm making here is that unlike before where they could literally just say, we want to change the interest rate and it would change and they didn't have to do anything. Now they actually have to do something, right? So when they change that interest on uh, IOR, right? They also have to move that overnight reserve, reserve repo rate, overnight reverse repo rate. And that's actual market operations where people say to the Fed, here is um, some cash. I want to use a treasury bond overnight. Um, and so there's actual transactions taking place. And so the Fed just can't dump all these securities if they need to tighten. This is, this is the, 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 the point that's, that's really important here to make and that, and that why they're going to need to transition to yield curve control, right? If they need to tighten to fix the, sh the shape of the yield curve and get it to be upward sloping again. They cannot sell those securities because they'll cause absolute chaos in um, the bond market. Uh, and this is very, very similar to the situation that played out in the second half of the 1930s. And then during World War II and through the 1940s, when the Fed promised to, um, uh, when the Fed promised to finance uh, World War II by holding rates fixed. So even after the war ended, and we'll talk about this in a minute, even after the war ended, the Fed was had promised to keep um, uh, government long-term government bond rates at 2.5%. And so when the Korean War started, inflation accelerated, and the Fed was stuck in a, between a rock and a hard place. They had promised the Fed, uh, the Treasury Department, that they wouldn't raise rates. But... Uh, right. If yes. I may interrupt for a second, oh yeah, is no. It okay, to um, is it okay to share the slides on the on the chat? Are you okay? Oh with that? yeah, yeah. Yep, because I'm just because some people cannot access the LinkedIn, so I'm just gonna uh, oh sure. It for them. Didn't That's even, all. Uh... Yeah, we appreciate it. Oh yeah. Okay, so let me. Do... Didn't even think about. No, it. go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. All right. So. So here we are. And just looking at the similarity of the situation, right? Coming out of World War II, uh, debt to GDP was over 100% of government debt to GDP. And uh, the Fed was very constrained in its policy and there was there was uh, huge fights. I, I wrote a, a note about it that's posted on my, um, on my Substack page. Um, there were very, uh, there was an intense bureaucratic fight between um, the, the, Fed, the Federal Reserve and the Treasury Department after World War II, because the Fed wanted to drop the rate cap, but the, the Treasury Department needed to get their deficits funded cheap. Um, uh, the exact same thing is playing out now, where if you look, the, the, the debt to GDP ratio is at where it was 
after World War II, and it's expected to keep rising. Yes. Sorry, um, just um, one second. So just I want to confirm myself. Okay, so before, the, and again, like sorry to interrupt, but just the previous, um, the previous discussion. So sticking to the first part of the monetary policy, like between 2008 and now, before quantitative time tightening, let's say, right? Yep. So, so formerly, prior to 2008, they had like that, there was an announcement effect due to the sort of, we're not in an abundant reserve system, so to say, right? So there is an right. announcement effect. And sort of the interbank system resolves the whole mechanism on their own, right? Exactly. That's kind of my understanding. Okay. So after that, what is the reason that the Fed changed monetary policy into an, what would lead to an abundant reserve system on one side? Mm -hmm. And then, um, right. And so respectfully, like that excessive buying of, uh, you know, uh, bonds and like mortgage backed securities, et cetera, that sort of then to your point cannot be actually um, you know, removed in a way such as selling them, and, and you're going to get to that. Uh, but just like what le what was the reason for that change in regime and, um, you know, sort of the Fed going, you know, that route? You know, right. Just for our audience, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the justification has taken place after the fact. So I think they knew at the time they needed to prop up the government bond market and mortgage-backed securities, and so that meant buying them. Um the Fed is required legally to transact in the open market with its primary dealers. So there are certain banks that are have been vetted and are legally able to transact with the Fed. They all have accounts at the Federal Reserve. So just the act of deciding to buy securities, right, is going to add reserves to the system, right? Now, if banks were super bullish, right? If for some reason they were buying securities and the banks were super bullish, those reserves wouldn't sit at the Fed. They would be then taken and lent out, right? So it would have remained a scarce regime. Because the buying was taking place in a huge volume at a time of panic, the reserves stacked up at the Fed and became excess reserves. So in September 2008, they don't really care about the reserves. They want them to be stacked up and okay, fine. After that, they have this issue of, okay, whoa, if we suddenly sell off all these uh, securities to shrink the reserves, we'll cause chaos in the bond market, right? And, um, you know, th this thing, this all happened at, at, at the same time, right? So that the if the Fed had been acting on its own in a calm environment, it could have avoided getting trapped, right? But the, the problem is, is that they're adding to their balance sheet. They're buying up all this government debt. At the same time, the government is issuing huge, huge, huge amounts of debt for a decade now, right? So the bond market swelled in size as the Fed was making these purchases. So the bond market that they entered right, is not the same bond market that they're going to exit. And that creates a dilemma for them in that they say, okay, well, if we then try and shrink reserves to prevent lending, to, to tighten policy, we're going to cause chaos in the market because there are so many bonds that need to be sold. Um, and, and, the, uh, and many of the buyers of long-term government bonds are buying them for safety, right? They don't want to find out that there's going to be five or 10 years of selling pressure caused by the Fed. Uh, so that was why they were just letting them run off. Um, so they had, to, they had to operate with these reserves in the system. And so the abundant reserves regime is really, they had already planned to do that. And it really was the only way to do, to, to um, so they, the fact that the, the, the government had run up so much debt the Federal Reserve had bought that debt, um, and the banks now had all those reserves sitting on their balance sheet, uh, were a consequence of the financial crisis, and it, it created a situation that the Fed couldn't get itself back out of. Okay, okay, and now to the QT, like the quantitative tightening part. Right. Yep. <laughs> so, and so when they get to that tightening, that's the issue, is that they're saying, okay, we're going to let the reserves run off, right? So that was their thing, it was like, okay, we'll, we'll, raise interest rates and we'll just naturally let this feed of, of um, maturing bonds and money go back into the market 
uh, and that will allow the back end of the curve to rise smoothly, right? And maybe that would have happened, right? I mean, it, it did for the Bank of Japan to a certain extent um, in there, you know, the, the Bank of Japan just precedes the, the Federal Reserve by five years in, in everything. So, um, it, so it had worked to a certain extent for the, for the Bank of Japan prior to the global financial crisis of 2008, but mm -hmm. COVID happened. So it, it you know, they, they did the exact same thing and they went even bigger. They bought more bonds and they, and they, were, they completely removed the need to have a, a reserve minimum because it, it made no sense anymore. Um, so banks are no longer required to have a, uh, any reserves. They do because there's just so many and they have more than they know what to do with, right? So it's a strange situation. Yeah, they no longer need a minimum. Right. right, and so the Fed can't. Right, so so the Fed. I mean, it's a situation to be careful what you wish yeah. for because the Fed can't say exactly you need to have this many reserves, right? So what they're going to be do, what they're going to be forced into is um, using the standing repo facility and the overnight reverse repo facility um, to guide the back end of the curve under the guise of managing liquidity in the cash market. Um, so let's see. Uh, so, and then the, uh, here we go. And the upshot of all this is, is like, if growth was going to be huge, then that would be much less of a problem, right? Like in good times, it's easy, easier, uh, to balance the money supply. Right. Um, the problem is, is that now this is a whole, this slide itself is a whole discussion for another day. But um, whether slower growth is leading to lower participation or lower participation is leading to slower growth, either way, right now, the potential growth rate of the US economy is probably right around zero. Um, and that's why any growth is going to be causing inflationary pressure. Um, so if the Fed is going to try and hit its 2% target of in inflation rate, um, they're going to find out that they can't have their two to three percent unofficial growth rate that's politically implemented. So politicians are going to be saying, hey, interest rates are too high. What is, what is growth is too slow. But every time they cut interest rates, they're going to run into this speed limit on growth. Um, and a big part of that is driven by the, the diminished participation rate. Um, so just to, to quickly wrap up uh, and then we'll get to Q&A, like how do we get here, right? So the volatility of the 1970s, right? The inflation volatility that took place. The Fed had mismatched the neutral rate, right? The rate at which there is no inflation or deflation. Um, and they got the policy rate way off from that, right? But they, the long-term interest rate was not so far off. And that's why um, asset markets were not as crazy, right? What the Fed did was, it, after the great inflation, it says to itself, okay, we're never going to let that happen again. We're going to 100% focus on inflation, price inflation of consumer goods and services, right? But what they did was they ignored intertemporal pricing, which is interest rates. So interest rates determine, okay, what is the price of, of a can of soda today versus five years from now, right? So what they were saying was, what is the price of soda today versus yesterday. And they were making sure that that stayed very stable and they were good at it. What they did not think about was what are the implications for the person who owns the machinery that makes the soda and the soda can? If you say, hey, hey, don't worry, no matter how much soda any idiot makes, we're gonna make sure that you get more money for that soda to, in five years than you do now, right? The price of soda will never go down. So what are you going to do? And they said that with everything. So every single business in the, in the world, as far as this dominated, a US dollar dominated world, has been told, we're never going to let prices for your goods go down. It's always going to be 2%. So do what you like, right? And, and as a result, this price fluctuation in capital took place, right? And now we see the household network to GDP is at an insane level. This used to look insane back before this all took place, right? It looked crazy and it, it, the chart now, so if you see where this uh, household net worth to GDP is relative to where the 1970s level, I tried to balance them, right? That's how 
imbalanced things are, right? So just as things were really screwed up in the 1970s and everybody found out the hard way when it came to an end, the same exact thing. The difference is, is that in the 1970s, it was growth potential because of labor productivity. In the, since the 1990s, the problem has been um, growth potential because of capital productivity and malinvestment. And this is where the Austrian theory comes in. Uh, and so just like in 2008, just like in 2011, the reason that energy prices and food prices are, are in so-called crisis mode is not random. It's that people don't want to hold fiat currency. Right, those there is a monetary crisis taking place across the advanced economies, right? Um, and, and as a result, um, there is a feedback loop between um, food prices, corn and, and soybeans, and diesel and gasoline. And so, the Fed faces a, a, a problem of having the inflationary problems of the 1970s caused by these bottlenecks and low participation, but at the same time. They have asset prices all screwed up, which they've done from past mistakes. So this is why the situation right now is so dangerous, because depending on which, you know, the, the um, uh, you know, the Scylla or Shibolis, like depending on which monster they choose to fight, there's another one that's potentially looming. So if they fight the capital monster and try and prevent an asset price crash, they'll get inflation. If they try and fight inflation uh, and prevent another 1970s style grade inflation, you'll get an asset price crash. Uh, and so uh, I'll leave you with this when we'll get to the, the Q&A. And this is um, a chart system from Roger Garrison. And I'm going to be, who's a, one of the you know, preeminent um, Austrian economists. Uh, he's at Auburn University. And he developed this chart system so that Austrians and Keynesians could talk to each other. Uh, and so down on the bottom right, the one, the number one, that's that market for funds that, de that determines the shape of the yield curve, right? In this number two position, that's the, um, uh, um, the productive productivity frontier. And so that's the ability of the economy to produce either investment goods or consumption goods and how that gets determined. Uh, if you're above the line, you're gonna have inflation. And if you're below it, you're gonna have deflation. And then over on the left is, is Hayek's triangle. And so on the blog, I'm going to be um, trying to do a lot of education about how this works and what it means. And so the people can use this to better understand um, what is, uh, what's going on around them. Um, just before we get to the q and I just want to make sure to highlight for um, any institutional investors um, or um, high net worth uh, who are interested in advisory services, there's going to be a uh, follow-up call on July 7th uh, to discuss this and why paying someone makes sense. Um, so you can email Eddie Osborne at Independent Research Forum and um, I'll maybe put that in the uh, chat or something, but, um, and we can do some Q&A. All right. Good stuff. Hmm. I don't know where to start. Uh, <laughs> do you guys uh, do you guys have any questions? Actually, I want to kind of give the opportunity to others first. Okay. Uh, let Let me start then. Let me start first. So okay. So the uh, well. So just like I'm trying to understand, like the comparison that you gave to the um, was like 50s to 60s and like leading into 70s inflation time, right? Mm -hmm. So there was kind of like mismatched monetary policy at the time. And um, to what extent, like you're saying, like what would, how would you define the mismatch that you perceive now that perhaps led to the current situation or mm -hmm. um, in that sense, mm -hmm. right? So what usually, is, like, do you really think we could? Because, because I know you mentioned kind of having not necessarily higher than now inflation. Let's say not necessarily super high inflation, but like having inflation volatility and kind mm -hmm. of uh, yeah, back, forth, back forth. inflation volatility regime. Mm -hmm. So 
that like the 70s or is it different or like how would it compare in your mind your kind of baseline scenario for the future compared in compared to that, let's say. Great mm. question, yeah. Um, I think it would be, um, the differences in the 1970s, the Fed was not as, had not committed itself to fighting inflation, right? So there was still more of a focus on full employment. After that, it became institutional defining. And so nobody wants to lose that um, inflation expectations anchor. And so part of that is because it was, they discovered what it was like when when you do lose it right inflation can just keep going right as expectations keep rising for inflation but also it impairs the ability of the fed to do its job right so what changes economic activity is not nominal um interest rates but real interest rates right so the interest rate that you're paying after you account for inflation so what the fed found um in the 1930s and then again in the 1970s and maybe they'll have to rediscover it again, but hopefully not, that you can, if inflation expectations are rising faster than you are increasing nominal rates, then real interest rates will fall. And that's stimulative to economic activity. So this time the Fed is, they're aware of that. And when they see inflation expectations start to rise, they're gonna wanna be aggressive and say, no, 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 we're gonna, sl- we're gonna slow things down and we're not gonna let get out of control. But at the same time, they've taken this very uh, anti-deflationary view, right, to a religious point of view. Um, And as soon as you see that slowdown caused by um, investment activity, right, it feeds through to prices and um, the Fed then panics and says, well, we're not going to slow down too much, right? And we're we're seeing this on a literal day-to-day basis with Jerome Powell talking back and forth, 50 basis points, 75 basis points, too much, not enough. Uh, so we're, we're, we're seeing it play out day to day. Um, and I, I think we'll have another situation that like that and, and to ease the, uh, uh, the, the Fed's dilemma, uh, using the repo facilities to set the yield curve as they see. And in, in a corridor, it won't be quite like the Bank of Japan, but it will be very similar where they'll set a, a floor and a ceiling on yields, um, you know, probably uh, across a mature a set of maturities. I think that the first key that we'll know that's coming will be a, an operation untwist. So um, operation twist happened in 2012. The Fed uh, sold a lot of bills and bought bonds to um, try and flatten the yield curve to pull down uh, long-term interest rates. What they and they still own a lot of bonds. What they might try and do is not necessarily shrink the balance sheet, but adjust its. Um, and they have been doing this by buying more bills since COVID. But um, as with um, uh, Twist, it wasn't enough, um, and they needed to go to more uh, substantive. Uh, right. So I mean, we're definitely thanks, Joseph. That's a great question. Um, so the, the exogenous shock has definitely already happened, and, and that is um, Russia's invasion of Ukraine throwing off um, soybean and, and corn markets, right? So the connection between um, energy prices and food was already there, we saw from 2007 and 2011. Um, that has been made much worse by the introduction of, of um, renewable diesel, which is you can mix with regular petroleum diesel. It's chemically the same, and it's made from soybean oil. Um, so now we have a very bad situation where if, because of monetary reasons or because of fear of holding currency, food prices rise or energy prices rise, either way, what happens is that incentivizes for farmers to then put in more fertilizer and farm more. Right, so that's using more natural gas and more um, diesel, which drives up the price, which increases the demand for renewable diesel. So you have a, a feedback loop that's developed between food and energy prices, and those have a huge effect on people's um, inflation expectations. So I think that that exogenous shock pretty much did the Fed in because it, it and took away that um, soft landing scenario because. 
uh, it, it created a shock to energy prices that set off food prices. Um, what could be a, a soft landing? It, it is. It's. It's hard to see. The, the geopolitical situation is just is very very risky. I mean, I'm very concerned about the situation on the Nile. Um, the rainfall in East Africa has been uh, disappointing this year, and uh, there's already fighting between um, Sudan and Ethiopia um, in the Al Farmaj Triangle, which is kind of um, a jumping off point for an invasion to Ethiopia. Um, so if if there isn't if there isn't a lot of rain this year, um, given the price of oil, uh, given the price of, of where wheat and corn have gone and what that's done to the Egyptian economy, um, they're going to be very very uh, proactive against uh, a filling of the the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, um, and so that could cause uh, a war right on the doorstep of the Middle East, which has implications for the Red Sea. Um, and that would cause the price of oil to go through the roof. So there's, there's some very bad situations. The, the, the disturbance of the food market kicked off um, uh, a series of dominoes that are still falling. And well, so just a very practical question I have now. Um, I've been looking at like, so, NBR really is the entity that generally announces, unofficially, but sort of really announces a recession right now. So it's, I know some people have been on the lookout for, okay, the second, is the second consecutive quarter gonna come from NBR, right? This kind of thing, but okay, but that's not enough. So I looked at their full set of factors they consider now, they look at employment, they look at personal income, uh, personal consumption expenditures, and there's like an industrial production, I think, measuring there. So they have like five or six variables that they're really, jointly considering yeah. until they make an announcement, right? Yeah. And so then in addition, and that's just a very short term now, you have like all the geopolitical, like all the macro kind of like risks that you refer to. And, um, you know, I'm sure they, they're there. But the question is, is it gonna really happen soon? Or does it seem like a wall of those NBR triggers may not actually happen just yet. And we could wait mm -hmm. for until next year or so forth. Because it seems like the first quarter of GDP decline that happened, I was listening to, um, you know, like to, uh, well, to an economist, I can mention his name, but so the, the, re the reference there was, okay, there was an excess growth, it appears in the, the last couple of quarters or Q4 at least. And so there's sort of a bit of an adjustment and, uh, and there was also some kind of attribution of that decline done in like in different ways. Okay, where, in what buckets is it falling and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so it, it seems to me almost like, okay, perhaps we're not gonna get the second quarter of decline. I, I was like heavily bearish before. And so it's sort of like, then I switched to that as a, you know, I, from that perspective. And then like also considering that NBR really has like those um, four or five other factors to, to factor in, you know, to factor into their decision. You know, so to so to say, and there is employment there, which has still been strong. So, do you feel that may get deferred until twenty twenty three? And yeah, oh, definitely. Or, I, I don't or, think yeah. that. Um, I don't think that we're. Uh, so, this is an issue that um, is very similar to what we what we saw in two thousand nineteen, mm -hmm. where um, and it's sort of like a. Uh, um, it's sort of a tell on how lazy Wall Street economists have become. Um, in that what they were doing was uh, the Wall Street and I mean, just everybody has sort of a, a, a potential growth rate in mind, right? And they say, okay, they look at the second derivative of growth and they say uh, of economic activity, which is, you know, so, so GDP change would be the first derivative and they look at the second derivative and they're saying, okay, GDP growth is decelerating. And so there's a, you know, say, say two and a half percent is like the potential growth rate. And there's an area of uncertainty around that just caused by statistical randomness. When it would go, when it would slow down outside of that, right? Say like one and a half percent, everybody would then say it would kick off this game of chicken among the Wall Street analysts. Oh, growth is slowing. It's likely to, it's below potential. It's, that's probably going to continue. And so that means recession is coming. And so it would become this game of chicken of who was going to call. And that's why that old joke that, economists have predicted nine of the last five recessions. And it's because they were looking at the second derivative instead of saying, and, and, 
saying, oh, the economy is slowing down, it's going to keep slowing down. So in 2019, what we saw was um, the just-in-time manufacturing and the, the supply chain has, has become so effective that the slowdown and speed up potential of the economy, right, is much faster than it used to be. So people see these extreme changes in rate and they say, oh my God, it's booming or oh my God, it's crashing. It's not, it's just that the, the system itself is able to change at that rate. And our models are not, are what are behind the curve. Um, and so what was, what's been made difficult is that, like I showed you that chart with the average two-year growth rate and the employment to population ratio. Saying that the growth rate is departing from the potential growth rate, right, is only reliable if you know what that potential growth rate is. If the growth rate is decelerating to a disappointingly low potential level, right, then you're not going to a recession, you're just slowing down towards your normal growth rate. And that's what I think is actually taking place right now is that the normal growth rate is zero. And so when there isn't stimulus and inflationary pressure being provided, it's stagnant. <laughs> so they say, oh my God, nothing's happening. Well, that's what the normal is. And that's what happens when you take one to 2% of the labor force and just say, we're gonna retire early and do nothing or whatever. Uh, so it'll be very interesting to see unless we get that potential growth rate to, I mean, that potential growth rate to rise by either increasing participation or by increasing worker productivity, uh, then the Fed is going to keep running into this issue of saying, well, the economy's not growing, but it's not going into recession. So what do we do? Every time we add stimulus, we get inflation. Uh, and that's, the, that's that stagflation that people are worried about. And that's, that's what we're in for. Unless they, what we need to do is to increase the rate of return on capital in our economy. The way to get out of this is to become a capitalist economy again, right? Is to raise the rate of return so that you can raise the interest rate and have a normally operating economy instead of just a bubble economy where projects take place because they have some super high expected rate of return uh, like coins or whatever, right? Uh, so we keep having these things. The only reason somebody builds something now is if they expect to make 10,000%. The idea of, of what is the proper risk adjusted return on a project and should that project occur uh, is less, less um, popular than it used to be. And that's because so much low return capital has been built, right? You build Coinbase, and you build all these servers and things like that because the price is inflated. And then afterwards they realize, oh crap, that stuff isn't worth what we thought it was worth. So now, all of a sudden, you have graphics cards that are being, you know, I mean, that, those are all projects that were done that turned out to have a much lower real rate of return than, was the, than, than everyone assumed when they got their, their pitch books. Um, and so until you have those projects moved out of the way through liquidation, opening up new higher rate of return projects, uh, you're going to get stuck in the stagflation. So you need to have um, a recapitalization of the economy, and that takes place by letting businesses fail. And this is what this is what Volcker did. He just said, "Well, you know what? Screw everybody. Raise interest rates. Right? The weak failed, and the strong survived. There was a capital market liquidation, and then the economy was able to reset itself. Um, and until the Fed accepts something like that needing to happen, they're just going to keep kicking the can down the road and." keep inflating that capital bubble bigger and bigger so that the eventual payback is all the worse. And, and at the end of it, you know, who knows? People could falsely blame capitalism for something that's not at all capitalistic, right? A central bank that sets the prices for everything is not a capitalist uh, um, entity. We have a question on the chat. Um, so do you expect the latest rates uh, VOMA Gadden regime uh, gonna extend complete, complemented by rather less volatile and secure drawdown on inequities given you expect volatility in headline prints through uh, 2022, 2023? So, yeah, so I, so I think this, um, the, the current sort of, harsh but steady 
and ongoing tr downward decline in equities um, seems to be the case is that they keep, they're not going to let this like a, a September 2008 happen again, um, but there's a lot of liquidation that needs to take place. Um, how that ends up playing out, I mean, it, 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 if, if they can keep kicking the can down the road, then yeah, then they can prevent that a bad liquidation scenario. Um, but if you have global events um, force their hand by causing really high inflation, right? Because we don't know how the political establishment is going to react. That's, that's a real problem, right? That um, if you could have some sort of reliable reaction from adults running the political situation, um, then you wouldn't have to worry. But um, just like in the 1970s, Richard Nixon and then Jimmy Carter refused to listen to any sort of reason and thought that if they told people what they should charge for things, that that's what would happen. Um, and came up with an increasingly complicated and less and less effective series of price control measures that just further and further reduced economic growth potential, right? So by every, Carter gets the blame for it, but he was just the, the latest in the series of people who said, oh, I can make the world the way I want it to. No, you can't. You're just gonna reduce growth potential and increase inflationary pressure. When, so at some point, hopefully, um, you know, Winston Churchill's statement that um, Americans always make the right choice after exhausting all other options, uh, comes true and we say, oh, wait a second. Oh, we actually have to run a capitalist economy. We can't just be get rich quick and you need to actually have things be worthwhile doing. Um, so, you know, we'll see if that happens. But once again, you know, that's taking on faith that the political system um, does that. So does that take one year? Does that take until the next presidential election? You know, I'm not sure. So I would be very cautious about uh, taking a, a long, unguarded position in equities in this year or next year or into 2024. Um, with blockchain, e-commerce, tech stocks, um, another great question. Um, so blockchain is a great technology and there's definitely um, going to be some sort of crypto economy that continues. Um, it's too useful for it not to exist. Um, what that looks like, I'm not brave enough to exactly say because, you know, uh, but uh, there's a great um, group that I'm involved with, Cryptonomous. Um, you can look online. Uh, um, they put out a podcast, the Conscious Renegade, um, and they, they're experts on, on crypto. So I would go to them for that. But uh, in general, um, capital projects that took place because of assumed rates of return um, are going to get liquidated. And projects that have actual rates of return because not enough of it was built, such as um, um, semiconductor manufacturing, right? So that's something we kind of left off the table that, that needed to get done. Um, uh, various types of um, uh, everything for providing nuclear power. That's something that nobody built for 50 years that all of a sudden they're going to say, oh, geez, we need nuclear plants again. Um, so. I think that there's uh, there's going to definitely be a shift in that capital, but you know the good companies will continue and will continue to make money. But definitely the the you know I think with the what what I'm interested in mostly with crypto is how much of a of a shadow banking system had developed, um, and that's not something you can really tell until after the fact. Um, and so we're seeing that with Celsius, where Celsius was just a shadow bank, and 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 a uh, um, a poorly thought out one at that. Uh, they were lending on both sides of their balance sheet against dollars and against crypto without any way to hedge. Um, so, you know, that was just a matter of time before that blew up. Um, and the problem with the shadow banking system is the pieces, the guts of a bank are spread out, right? And they're under different management teams and they have different networks and connections that can keep the individual organs of the bank living longer than the rest of the bank. And so that's what we saw with the, you know, the, 
the original financial crisis, you have, you know, commercial paper and, and special purpose of those vehicles blow up and then Bear Stearns and then other funding markets and then Lehman Brothers. Um, now we're seeing it with Luna and then Celsius uh, and then maybe Ethereum and then other things that in the shadow banking system will blow up. So how much credit creation has taken place as a result of crypto lending uh, and how much that has entangled banks and, and um, money market funds will determine how much fallout there is from the crypto thing. So uh, wait and see and keep an, eye, keep an eye out. Probably not huge, but uh, because it didn't get into the, into the money markets. That's, that's such a key. And that's something I want, really want everybody to take away from this is just how important money markets are, right? That is the, the, the lifeblood of capitalism and how resources are allocated. Um, and the reason that a small number of subprime mortgages were able to do so much damage was because the assets of those mortgages were included in money market securities that were taken to be like money. Just like we said, if you found out that your bank deposit was 95 cents instead of a dollar, You'd be like, what the heck? I thought my money's, it's, it's, a, it's money, it's a deposit, right? And this is what people in Canada found out when Trudeau said, oh, well, if you donate it to someone I don't like, you can't have your bank account money. And they said, wait a second, but it's my money. No, it's not. It's a bank deposit, right? You don't have any money in the bank. You own deposits, which are securities of the bank. And that misconception has allowed our banking system to operate as it has and, and creates a lot of danger. So really learn that you don't have any money in the bank. You have bank deposits that you own. Um, and uh, um, if those bank deposits are, ba are backed or some form of them like money market funds are backed by crypto assets that could very quickly set off a panic. Uh, I don't know that that's the case. I don't, it doesn't seem to be, but um, I wouldn't guarantee it. So, but let's say, so before we, we're already over time and thanks for taking actually oh, my um, pleasure. much time here to answer um, the different questions. But um, so what do you see like in the, let's say, because for you would be cautious like between, you know, 2022, 2024 in this current period of, let's say, perhaps like high inflation volatility and like other triggers, like cautious to take, let's say, a long position in stocks, right? But what would you see as the next, like considering that a lot of the small cap technology kind of went to like 10, 15, 20% of its initial value due to that excess, um, you know, overvaluation on like sort of hopes and dreams in a way. And so, um, so considering there already at 15% of their initial value. So let's say seven times um, reduced in value. You know, would you say that, and that's fairly, you know, relatively quick, you know, like five, six months only into this process. Mm -hmm. As we go forward, you know, 18 months and so forth, would you expect that the next step would be for those companies perhaps just to go out of business? Or, or would you expect that they sort of reach the bottom? And if so, what other subsectors in the S&P 500 you would see to be the, the kind of the next thing to get hurt. Right. I mean, that's, that's the, the value of diversification, right? I mean, it, yeah, it's yeah. like the, 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 the like benefit and the curse, right? So most yeah. people can't invest individually in 5,000 companies, right? Yeah. Like if you could, you'd be great. Um, so yeah, some of those companies have, are oversold and will probably bounce back and others will just disappear. Um, you know, if you can, spread out your cash. I mean, what I think the, the issue is, is that we don't know how long this is going to take and we don't know how much um, cash flow pressure companies are going to be in based on how steep the yield curve is, right? So companies that are able to generate cash internally and fund their own projects, right? So the opposite of zombie companies, um, those companies have a huge advantage because they can then say, they can go to their own bank that they themselves are, right? Um, and say, okay, our competitors are on their knees. We can go buy things from them, right? We can go take customers. We can go buy, uh, buy back stock that's, that's undervalued. So companies that have um, uh, stacked up cash that continue to produce cash um, and that 
you know, um, can invest in high return projects when prices are low. Those are the, the ones that are going to be the winners. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, there one way to do it if you if you don't want to put in the work. One way to do it is to buy an index, and, and you'll get um, probably you know above average returns if you wait uh, long enough. Um, if you want to produce super normal returns, then definitely you know bottom fishing in that area and looking for companies that are just they have the wrong name. They're called you know crypto something whatever, even though their their cash flows are from security, right? So if if you're if you're a technology security company. And you have made the mistake of having crypto in your name. You probably sold off, right? But your business hasn't deteriorated. It's gotten better. Um, mm -hmm. So there's definitely situations like that where companies have been caught up in it. But um, I think there could be uh, another year or two of trading sideways before you get a, a widespread um, increase in prices. So that's the sort of thing. If you want a bottom feed probably a good idea to be picking individual winners now rather than just the index and the index will start to pay off in 2023. Awesome. That was really great. And so any, um, any last questions, anyone actually, before we wrap up for today? No. So, um, so Brian, what is the best way for people to reach to you? I know you shared about like um, that next lecture you guys have two days from now, right? On this. Right. So um, yeah, it, if uh, you check in the chat there or look on the thing, you can um, for institutions um, and high net worth investors is a presentation on the seventh um, to follow up on this and get into details about how they can manage it in their portfolio. Um, for retail investors and just um, economics nerds like me, um, go to intertemporal.substack.com and uh, check out my newsletter. Uh, and there's all sorts of fun stuff on there. Perfect. Thank you so much. This was really great. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.